Okay, I think we're live. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session full of CoCadme Live for Creative Coding. Um, hi again, I am Jiwon, and I'm a curriculum developer at CoCadme. And today we've also got Morgan joining us. Morgan, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit. Hey, everybody. I'm Morgan, and I'm a content contributor at Code Academy. Yeah, and he also was part of the uh, production team that helped us develop the Learn P5.js course. Um, and he's also created the um, project which we're going to walk through today together as well. So um, thank you, Morgan, for um, joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here. OK, cool. Um, I think we can get started and maybe we'll also do a little bit of a recap, but basically, um, let me actually start sharing my screen too. Um, um, basically, um, these live series, uh, during these live series, we're going through um, P5.js and we're going off a lot of the content that is based on this course holder in P5.js on the Codecademy platform. It's a free course, so if you are following along the live stream series, um, I think um, generally the live stream series uh, are the designed to go, be a good complement to the Learn P5.js course, the content itself. So in the first week, the first session, live series session, we went through some fundamental um, concepts about P5.js. We talked about using the setup and the draw loop, and we also did some um, static visualizations using 2D primitive shapes. And our second session, uh, we turned those static shapes into animations in, within the draw loop and using you know, incrementing and decrementing values to um, animate the position, size, and color, and so on for the animation. Last week, actually, we had um, Cassie, um, as jo who joined us as um, guest, and we talked about the P5.js. Um, open source communities, open source software, and also we talked about the P5.js web editor, which we are going to um, use for um, today's live stream series. And also going forward, we'll be um, using the like, P5.js web editor to do programming in, and also to share the sketch or the link to the code with you guys. So we're actually not going to be working on the CodeCamry platform itself, um, but we're going to be um, creating all of our P5.js creations inside of this web editor. And Cassie, um, who's one of the main developers for the platform, gave us a really good tour um, around the tool itself. So right now I have this code loaded for um, our live session today, but let's actually look, open it up in another place. Editor. Um, so if you know, if you uh, open up a blank P5.js editor, this is kind of the view of what you will get. But basically, let me actually log out. But I log out. But if I log out, you get an option to log in or sign up. If you um, click to sign up, it doesn't really ask for a lot. This is kind of all what they ask for from you. You can put in your username, your email, and your password, and confirm your password, and you will get a P5.js um, account. I will. Oops, okay, I should have stayed logged in, but maybe I'll turn up screen share and quickly type that in in a bit. But basically the thing that I do wanna show you is that when you first launch it, uh, you will see this view on the left side that is a code editor and you have this preview page. And if you open up this um, little uh, collapsed bar on the left side, you get a view of these sketch files in here. And then these are the similar, you know, we talked about this in the first session, but basically they are all the files that you, it is required for you to run the P5.js sketch. There's an index.js file with the library files um, uh, linked there as a script tag, the CDN link in there. And there's a link to the style sheet. And there's also a link to the scripts that you're using the JavaScript that you're using inside of the sketch.js file. So that's all linked in here for you. So this is kind of like the default um, generated files you get when you first open up uh, your P5.js web editor. And let me actually stop sharing and quickly log in. I did not anticipate this part. <laughs> Always got to be prepared. Yeah. And um, let me see <laughs> if it will let me log back in. <laughs> what is going on in here? Um, okay, I don't think that that will matter too much. I'm going to move on and reshare. Re Sounds good. Um, okay, but going forward, um, the thing that we're going to be covering, the topics that we're going to be covering are in this third module inside of interaction. So um, if you click on the lesson for interaction, uh, basically it starts off talking about um, 
um, different kinds of interactions that you can add to the P5.js sketch. So um, Morgan, if you want to give us like a super brief overview of what the, uh, the kind of topics that we learn in this module, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So I think interactions really like kind of the, like one of the beginnings of like the bread and butter of P5.js and just um, really being able to use your mouse, your keyboard, um, and then for more advanced interactions like your voice to actually like be able to control programs and work with programs, make games or interactive art pieces and things like that. So um, via like mouse scroll, mouse click, um, or like mouse up or key presses and things like that or kind of what's covered in this, uh, this lesson specifically. Mm -hmm. And so for today's um, project, uh, we're going to be going through this particular project that is on the Kokami platform called the Generative Art Creator. And for this project, basically we're gonna be using, uh, mapping a lot of these like functions to key press and key events. And we've kind of sort of taken this uh, web editor, sorry, we've taken this project onto the web editor. So on the YouTube um, video, inside of the descriptions part, there should be a link to, two links to the P5 web editor website. There's one for the solution code for the project. And then there's also a link for the starting code of the project. So what we're gonna be doing during this live session is going to be working on the solution code, which actually has inside of the solution code, there will be a lot of comments in here, not to <laughs> freak anyone out, but I've basically moved the steps that you will normally see inside of our platform on the projects page onto the P5 web editor, so you can follow along um, with us on the web editor if you want. So if you were to open up that link in that's connected inside of the, uh, that's um, attached inside of the uh, description of the YouTube video, you can also go to file and duplicate or save um, this particular sketch inside of your account, of your web editor account. You can keep uh, a copy of the sketch in there as well and code along with it. Same goes for the solution code if you wanted to create a duplicate or a copy of the solution code um, in your account that is also possible. But before we go any further, I guess I want to give you guys a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be making. So uh, on the P5 editor, on the right side, we've got this um, preview window. And on the left side, we've got the sketch window where you can you know, um, change code in here if you, we wanted to. If we click on this uh, run button, the, this pink, big, big pink um, play button, then our sketch is running. The reason why there's nothing in here is because this particular sketch is but like it's like an app, right? It's a generative app um, that has, um, I don't know if you guys, you guys can't see this, but I am pressing different keys on my keyboard to basically do these drawings onto the sketch. And um, there are different functions that are mapped to different kinds of keys on my keyboard. And if I press the return key, I've got this, uh, you see that I've downloaded this um, image of the canvas um, as an image file, as a JPEG file. Um, and also if I press, spacebar, it will um, basically erase everything that we've drawn onto the here. So it's kind of like a, I guess, a version of the paint app, but um, using our own custom uh, visualization functions. Yeah, exactly. And also, it's, this is also something that is provided in the start code as well, but there are all the functions that we're using to generate all these visualizations are saved in a separate file called drawshapes.js in here. So you should be able to see, you know, what's running behind the scenes to create all of those different kinds of visualizations. So the actual visualizations part, we're not going too deep into in this session. It will be mostly focusing on how to add uh, keyboard events to your P5.js sketches in this session. Did I miss anything? No, I think that's it. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. So um, I'm going to move on to the, um, the file for the starting code. And I'm actually going to create a duplicate of this because I don't want to. Did I create a duplicate? Something funky going on with my. Uh, OK. Since I am logged out, any changes on to this um, starting code is not going to be actually affected to the version of the um, sketch that I've shared with you guys already. So I'm actually going to go ahead and start coding in this version of the starting code for the generative art creator project. Um, and so we'll take it from the top, actually, and then we'll go. OK, so just to, um, a little note as well. 
I've also numbered the steps that um, are that the steps that you should follow to complete this project. We'll start from step one in the setup, but then you'll quickly notice that there's step two in the setup, but then it gets to step four in the draw. So the place of where all the steps are do jump around a little bit. So I'm hoping that, you know, if you're watching if this live stream together with us, or if you're going to be looking at this um, in a later date, um, I wanted to put it out there. So that's recorded information that the steps are going to be jumping through, but then we're going to be doing this together with you guys. So hopefully that'll be a little bit less confusing. But the first step that we're going to be doing, and if I press play in here, you see that there's nothing being um, created in the preview. So I'm going to go ahead and then I'm going to create the first, um, one of the most important functions that you can use in the setup, which is to do, uh, use the create um, canvas function. Oops, canvas. And inside of the create canvas function, I'm going to be um, putting in system, uh, p5.js built-in variables, window width and window, window height. So that when we do this and we're not gonna see anything in here, but basically what will happen with this function is that it will create a canvas with the size of the window width and window height, or in the case of P5.js web editor, it will use the width and height of the preview window in here. I am also going to add in a background color so that we can actually see something inside of the preview window that's gonna happen. For now, I'm gonna give it a gray value of 50. Um, so this is the same as, right, same as writing 50 comma 50, oops. 50 comma 50 comma 50. But the shorthand for that, if you're using all same values for R, G, and B, they can just write 50. So if you go ahead and press play, we've got this gray rectangle of a canvas that is perfectly the width and height of our preview window. Cool. So then we're gonna move on and it says step two is we're going to be randomizing variables to draw shapes. So here in lines uh, five to nine in here, we've got some global variables. We've got let X and Y, we've got let speed X and speed Y, we've got red bell, green bell and blue bell. Um, and we've got some, an, another um, two other global variables and so on. Um, these um, global variables and lines, well, actually all of these variables, uh, global variables in lines five to nine are actually gonna be used inside of our draw shapes.js. Um, uh, file, and they are going to be used inside of all of these functions that generate um, these different kinds of visualizations that I have already been put in for you. Um, but basically, um, we will need to randomize some of these functions, uh, sorry, some of the values for some of these variables in here so that we can get a dyna generate dynamic sort of um, visualizations. So there are some things that are randomized when the sketch first runs, and then there are some things that will be generated uh, that are attached to keyboard events. Um, so let's go ahead and follow these steps for step A to step 2A to 2D. So for 2A, it says set a X variable to a random number between zero and width. And we're going to use the random function, which is also a P5.js built-in function. So it will be a minimum. Uh, I want a random number between a minimum of zero and a maximum of width, which is also a P... Ah, oh, I keep misspelling that, which is also a um, P5 just um, built-in variable that returns the width of the canvas. This is really interesting where here we've got when the width um, as the um, width of the canvas, which will return us the total width of the preview window. And because we're also using width, which is the canvas's width, um, that's going to be same as the preview window. That's actually what we get, right? This also means that if our um, preview window is bigger, and then you run it, then this is now become, it will become the width of the canvas. Let me actually resize that so you guys can see the code a little better. So now we've got um, X, we've set our X inside our set of function to be a random number, any random number between zero and width. And then for Y, we'll do the same thing, but use um, height instead of width. So we'll use the random function again, and we want to generate a random number between zero and height. And then for our step 2C, we'll do a similar thing of generating a random number, but this time it'll be between minus three and three. So speed x global variable is going to be initialized with a value, a random value between minus three and three inside of our setup function. Again, last thing for step, uh, step 2D, we'll do uh, speed y global variable is going to have a random number between minus three and three. So this is sort of these, um, I guess, setup 
that we had to do. And actually, we're doing this in the setup function. So how convenient that the <laughs> function is called setup. But um, just to re uh, just so as a reminder, the setup function runs once when the when the sketch is first loaded. So all of these are going to be done once. And then right after everything inside of our draw function is going to run after. But before we get to actually, you know, putting some things inside of our draw function, we're going to do something similar to another function that we're going to declare outside of the draw. So this is the part that where um, keyboard interaction comes in. But basically inside, so there's a step three in, it's now become line 80. I don't know if it would be still line 80 in the blank file, but towards the end of the sketch.js file, there is a step three and it says add key release function to, random, randomize, to randomize variables again in the key release. So what's gonna happen is that all of these variables are gonna be in it randomly set when the sketch first loads. And whenever a key is pressed and then released, we're going to be resetting all of these values, global variables into another random number. So the next time another key is pressed, uh, we'll be um, having some sort of a random element to the um, visualizations that get created with key, um, key events. So maybe uh, we should, there's a bit of a, I guess, a, some information that we need to cover before we do this. So I guess, let me ask you, Morgan, what is the key release function? Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I guess something maybe we should have mentioned a bit before, but a lot of what interaction entails with um, P5 is these sets of predefined functions uh, for either mouse presses, key presses, things like that. So key released will trigger an event um, inside of the key release function whenever that key is released. And you can set specific keys. Um, another way, I won't mention that yet, but yes, the key <laughs> release function, whenever you release a key, um, whatever, um, information is inside that function will be run. I think it's something um, that might not be so noticeable when you're like just accustomed to, I mean, mouse is a relatively friendly, I think, what's the right word for this? Like computer accessory, computer auxiliary input device. Yeah. Um, if you think about it, you do a lot of things with the mouse, right? There's a click, there's a double click, but then that click is also, it can be separated into two separate events, right? Mm -hmm. Where there is the press event and there's also a release event. So for all, each of those events that your um, keyboard and also your mouse can detect, um, there are functions uh, built in the five just functions in here. So the mouse for mouse event, there is all of these things where there's a, we've looked at mouse X and mouse Y um, variables um, before in, I think, did we do this, I think, in week two? I believe so, uh, when we were talking about animation. But those are these uh, built-in variables that return you the position of the mouse X and mouse Y positions uh, of your mouse. But there are also functions in here and also um, variables in here that basically let you know or let you let you run different code snippets uh, depending on a whether a particular mouse or keyboard event has occurred. So in this case, and in, inside of our um, P5 web editor, where, oops, maybe this one, it talks about add key release function. What it means is that add this built-in function called the key released. Um, and then here in the description, it says the key release function is called once every time a key is released. So it kind of like works in a similar way to our draw and the setup functions that were also um, built in P5.js functions where we, so we have to define it, but there's, we don't need to run that function actually for it we, us to trigger um, the things inside of the key release function. Instead, the contents inside of that function will run for us whenever that key release uh, event is detected. So in here, I'm going to say function key release. And then I'll open my curly bracket. I'm going to close my curly bracket after all of these steps because I'm going to do all of these inside of the key release function. So in between those, um, I've created a, function, a new function definition for the key released um, built in P5.js function. And inside of the key release function, I'll do the same thing for the global variables x, y, and speed x and speed y. And I'll randomize them to a new set of numbers. So this means that every time you press then release the key, then all of these variables are randomly set again. So for step 3a, I'm going to say, X is equal to a random number between a minimum of zero and maximum of width. Similar thing for the y global variable. I'll set it to a random number between zero and height. 
I think it also might help to to um, bring up that the key release function is indiscriminate of what key you're pressing. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, but I guess a little bit more adding on to that, I think what Morgan is trying to say is that there are different types of keys on your keyboard, right? There are like normal, mm. I don't want to say normal keys, but there are <laughs> keys that have a visual impact, let's say, to the things that you're typing. So all of these things that I'm, you know, typing right now, all the letter keys, all the number keys, but there are also other keys on your keyboard, like the delete button, the space button. Okay, space has some, you know, space does have a visual characteristic, but um, arrow keys and return keys and shift keys and all that kind of stuff. So there are what's called special keys, right? And then yeah. the thing that the key release function will do is that it doesn't care whatever the key that you pressed on your keyboard, whether it's a letter key or a number key or a special key, it will run it whenever a particular key is released. Um, okay, so going back in here, <laughs> I'm going to randomly assign a random number between minus three and three for the speed x global variable and same thing for the speed y global variable. I will say speed y is now equal to a num random number between minus three and three. And so basically we've, I think we've more or less, uh, we're more or less done, right? With setting up um, for the global variable values and now we're ready to start actually drawing some things um, by triggering, well, actually we're not gonna blindly draw them. We're going to trigger them um, inside of our draw function. And we're going to first detect if a key is pressed uh, while the sketch is running and then check what sort of key is pressed. I'm leaving this a little bit vague because we're going to explain it in a bit, but it is going to be a little bit vague as well, uh, the way that we decide what, which function to run. Um, but um, yeah, okay, let's leave it at that. But basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna check if the key is pressed inside of our draw loop and run um, one function over the other, depending on what type of key, what, what key is pressed. So in here it says, okay, step four is going to be about mapping key uh, inputs to various shape drawing functions. And step 4a tells me that I have to create an if statement to check if the key pre is pressed is true and key is not equal to spacebar. So at this point, I think we should go back in here. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and under this events, under the keyboard section, there is what's called key is pressed, which is something that is mentioned inside of the step 4a. It says check if key is pressed is true. So then this probably means that I have to use this variable, which is a key, key is pressed is a built-in p address variable um, that returns a Boolean value um, what, depending on whether key is pressed or not. So for those of you who are not familiar with Boolean value, it basically means that it's a binary value. You can, you can either have a true as a value for the variable or false as a value for the variable. So if a key, any key on your keyboard, uh, on, when you're running this P5JS um, sketch is pressed, the key is pressed variable will return true. If there's no keys being pressed at that moment in time, this variable is going to return false. So there's a little bit of an example oops in here, which is actually, okay, I should not press the space. So <laughs> if I'm, I'm pressing an A key on my keyboard and you can see that um, while, my, while I'm press, holding down my A key on my keyboard, um, the fill color is black. And if I lift it up, the fill color is white. So, and this is being um, used uh, inside of an if statement and it checks what the value of this key is pressed variable is. And we're going to be doing something very, very similar to that. Um, but before we go on from that, I also want to check the documentation for the key variable. So here it says key is also a P5JS built-in variable, but it contains the value of the most recent key on the keyboard that is typed. So what it means is that um, the key value and as you can see, you can actually see all the keys that I'm pressing, which is how convenient. So I'm pressing, if I press the Q keyboard, it will draw in text inside a draw function. It will um, show me what key that I've pressed inside of using the text um, shape function. And also if I press W, then it will show that and so on. And if I press the number keys, it will do that too. But if I press, let's say the delete key, oh, it, uh, it shows it me a longer, a yeah. yeah, it shows you the, the actual key code, it, the name for that particular key, which I mm -hmm. think, what is this, back, back? It's backspace. 
big Mac space. Yeah. And let's say if I do tab, oh, oops, tab, <laughs> um, it will write tab, all of that tab in there for you. So this is another thing that we're going to be using. Um, actually, is it? No, we're going to be using a key, but we're also going to be using key code soon. So I, that's why I got a little confused using using. Oh, code. yeah, yeah. But yeah, basically, this is what we're going to use. And why, why the key inside of this uh, line 20, the first step for A, um, in order for us to detect whether the key is not equal to space bar, to, you, uh, to, detect, to do that detection, we're going to be using the key built-in P5JS variable. So let's go ahead and do that. So first, I'm going to create an if statement. And an if statement will contain the condition inside of the uh, brackets or the parentheses and the curly brackets are going to be containing all the blocks inside of the if statement for it to run when the if statement condition is true. I am going to close the curly bracket at the very end here um, so that we can contain all of the instructions inside of the um, if statement. So inside of the if statement for the condition, we're going to write if key is pressed p uh, p5js built-in variable is, is is equal to true with three um, equation marks, uh, equal signs, is true. And, and you can combine um, you know, uh, conditions with two ampersands. So that and keyword here is replaced by these two ampersands in here. If key is, what are we gonna do? Uh, I'm kind not of equal giving, to the space bar so. Oh, not equal to space yeah, bar. Yeah. I'm kind of giving it away a little <laughs> bit, but um, <laughs> you can detect if the key is a space bar or not by putting the space in between the quotation marks. So what the key returns, the key um, B5JS built-in variable returns, as you saw a little bit here, it returns you the actual character of the key that you're pressing as a string. So the space bar, you can't see it here because it doesn't show you that blank space. But what the uh, space bar um, character, if you press the space character bar character returns is a blank space. So if we um, check whether the key is actually, if we do this, right? If we do, if key is equal to space bar, then it's going to check if the keyboard, the key is the space bar, pre um, space bar character is pressed. So I know that this is, we're kind of deviating from this step, but I do want to show you that this works by maybe putting in a console log statement in here. And so it would that, only work if it was the spacebar being pressed. Exactly, exactly. So now this um, console log statement will only run if a key is pressed and if that press key is the spacebar. Now console log spacebar is pressed. So once we have that and then we run that, so every time I press that spacebar, it will say spacebar is pressed. And then when it's not, pressed, it sort of stopped. I don't know if you can see this. Okay, let's <laughs> make that a little bigger. And then it says spacebar is pressed for a couple of times. Okay, maybe this is a really good question to talk about this, but I only pressed my spacebar once, but this apparently has printed five times. There's a reason for that. I wonder if um, anyone who are watching can figure this out, figure out why this is pressing a number of times, maybe we'll, Maybe we'll actually save that as a mystery for people to figure out while we go towards the um, next steps. And then we'll come back to this because it will be relevant when we you know, run any of these other code that we're about to put in. But we'll leave it there and then maybe give people some time to answer that. Uh, so moving on from that, inside the if statement, our step um, 4B is saying, create another if statement to check if the key code is provided into five, divided by five is equal to zero. So again, there's a number of things that we need to un unpack for, from that um, instruction. So I'm gonna go back to the reference page in here and I see that key code, the thing that I saw inside the instruction for step 4B is actually listed under the keyboard section of the P5JS reference. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And then I see that um, key code variable is a built-in P5JS variable that it detects special keys such as backspace, delete, enter, return, tab, escape, and so on. But you can also use key code to return the value of your ASCII code of your keyboard. So, okay, what is ASCII code? This is kind of like, you know, going, following one tail after another. That's programming uh, though. Yeah, that is programming ASCII code. So I'm gonna Google what ASCII code is and it's telling me, okay, it, 
something about a table and then okay let's go to the wikipedia article actually and it's basically saying that it's a character encoding blah 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 okay great so it has something to do with encoding the keys on your keyboard and if i go to images you get all of these what's called ascii tables and if i click on one of them maybe not that one okay i want something with a background so that we can see more clearly and also has not just hexadecimal. I'm getting very picky, but okay, maybe this one will do. <laughs> so here, if you take a look at what's called an ASCII table, it will tell us that there is um, some sort of a way of, you know, matching the keys on our keyboard. So like here, we've got this character, it's like the capital A's through Z, and we've also got small, um, small, what is it called? Small character A to Z. Lowercase. Lowercase <laughs> A through Z. Um, you know, big, big letter, small letter. That's why I got confused. And then you've got what's called, there's, there's a code for hexadecimal value and also decimal value. So all of these keys on your keyboard, they visually will um, give you on a, like a text input or like a um, Google Doc or what have you. Um, if you press the key A on your keyboard and if it's not, you know, cap lock, caps locked, then it will give you a, uh, a lowercase A. But really what it is doing behind the scenes is that it's saying, uh, okay, display the character 97 on this text editor or text input box. And so we're gonna be using that to basically um, divide all the possible keys on your keyboard into five categories. So we're going to use the um, ASCII code that we can get using the P a key code of P5JS built-in variable and say, um, because the reason why we're dividing into five categories is because if you go into the drawshapes.js file, you will notice that, okay, we've got parametric lines function, we've got bouncing ellipse function, we've got rounded rect function, got the star function and the flaw function. We have five different kinds of visualization functions that are built in for you, uh, that I created for you. So basically what we're gonna do is um, for all the, ask, the, the um, keys on your keyboard that is divisible by five and has a remainder of zero, we're going to uh, run one function. And if it's div um, divided by five and, and has a remainder of one, then we're gonna uh, run a different kinds of function. And this is one of the actual, more of a general um, programming technique um, using what's called a modulus. Mo modulus, did I spell that correctly? I, I don't so. think so. I, I, I did, oh, yeah. modular operations. So this is a, a general um, programming technique to basically, um, it's a little bit similar to switch cases if you're more familiar with that. But what it will do is that it will just um, create five buckets. I think that's the easiest way of thinking about it is that you create five categories or five buckets and you kind of go in an order of saying, okay, if it has index zero, this bucket, then one, another bucket, then two, another bucket. And it just goes through in an iterative loop. Okay, not an actual loop, but basically it's saying, um, we're dividing every possible chance into five set, five categories and we're going to run functions based on the remainder um, of what we get. And so that means that um, if let's say we're doing, you have only three options, then you can do a modulus of three, meaning that you can put in, you're creating three buckets and in which um, all of the possible scenarios are gonna fall into any of those three. I think it will make a little more sense when we actually start programming it. So what we're gonna do for step four B, it says, okay, create another if statement. So let me actually go ahead and create another if, and my closing curly brackets gonna come after here because I know that all of the instructions are going to have to be contained in here for that um, this particular if statement. And inside of the if statement for the condition, I'm going to use the key code built in B5JS variable. And then I'm going to divide it by five, five, but instead of using the divide slash, I'm going to use the modulus key. So if I do modulus, which is the percent sign and divide it and do modulus of five, what this will return is that whatever value of key code, it's going to divide it by five and then give me the remainder. So if I were to, let's say, divide um, 11, 11 and modulus five, what this will return me is, um, uh, five goes into 11 twice and it has a remainder of one. So the whole thing, all of this 11 modulus of five was going to return me one. And if this were to be, let's say 13, then it's going to give me a remainder of three and so on. So whatever the value of key code, 
there is a limited number of um, possibility of remainders that you can get when you divide a number by five and there will be remainder of zero, one, two, three, and four. So there we've created a um, way that we can categorize um, this spot, whatever this value might be into five separate categories. And I'm going to run this particular if statement only if the remainder is zero. Um, because that's what the instruction says. <laughs> so to create another if statement to check if the key code is divided by five is equal to zero. So this is just our bucket number one or bucket number zero, um, depending on how you want to count that. Um, and inside of this if statement for step four C, we're going to call the para, pair careful with the spelling, parametric Tricky lines. Spelling. Yeah, function, which is already created for us inside of the draw shapes.js function. So there's this the first function that is listed in here that does something. And then kind of if you loosely see that it's drawing a line doing something with speed and XY locations. Yeah. Okay, let's see what that is about. Uh, inside you might of... need to change the uh, the key in the main if statement first. It's uh, still checking if it equals ah, bar. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm gonna fix that and follow the instructions and make sure that we only run this big, the, the, the bigger, the outer if statement, only if the key is pressed and is not the space bar. So for everything else that is not the space bar, if you press any key and if the key's key code is divisible by five and returns zero for the remainder, there's a lot of ifs in there. But then if all of those conditions are met, then it's going to draw the parametric lines function. And there is a key that is um, that you can try uh -oh, using to run it. It says, okay, try pressing the A key. Because why? Let's go back to the ASCII table. And the A key has, okay, 27, 97. So I, I think- oh, it's going off the decimal of the-, the uh... Uh, so I think it's going after the, the it doesn't matter if you press the lower oh, case yeah, or the upper case. Oh yeah, that's because key code has a, key code's weird. I remember um, in the documentation that it's indiscriminate in some time, like some situations. With, yeah, uh, so key code actually can't tell whether you yeah. are pressing the key code, not not the your keyboard, but the key code A5JS built in variable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care or doesn't, it doesn't know if you're pressing a lowercase or uppercase character. So um, if you're pressing, even if your, your caps lock is off on your keyboard, it's always going to think that if you press the A key, you've entered in the uppercase character so that you will have to match it with this decimal number, which, oops, actually this is better so I can zoom in now. Um, the decimal number for the A key, the capital A key is 65 and 65 is divisible by uh, five and has a remainder of zero. So if we go back in here and then run the sketch and press the A key. This is what, okay, let me press it a little bit more. This is what the parametric lines visualization inside of draw uh, shapes.js looks like. This is and my so, personal favorite one. Yeah. So I'm actually holding down this A key. And then if I let go, the animation stops. And then if I press again, it picks up in a new location. So that whole uh, like generating a new location is actually happening because whenever we release that key, we are randomly setting x, y, speed x, and speed y variables again. So that's why you get you know a whole new colors and a whole new uh, well colors are actually happening for different reasons, but you, we get new lines every time we press and release the keyword. Um, maybe this is now now a good time to answer why we were getting this. A space bar is pressed a number of times um, printed to the console. Um, not anymore because we're not checking if the keyboard is um, pressed. <laughs> Sorry, we have um, Zoe in the chat saying that it's giving um, strong Windows 95 screen share advice, which, is, which it totally does. <laughs> um, but to answer that question that we threw earlier on uh, about why that print statement was happening over and over again, and also to um, tell you guys why, if I'm holding down the A key, we keep getting this um, animation of the lines moving around is because this is inside the draw loop. And even though we're using the if statement and we're saying if the key is pressed is true, but this is happening in a loop, which means that for that number of, it's not just one frame that your key might be pressed. It could be over a number of frames in, in number of continuous frames that uh, for that duration of frames, your key is pressed. 
So that's why while my key is, even though we're using an if statement, it's kind of like easier to think about it in the way that while your key is pressed because it's being looped, the check is being looped, um, you're going to be continuously trying this parametric line visualization. Did I say that right? Yeah. I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> perfect. Okay, cool. So then we can move on from that and then complete our step 4D. Okay, and, and it says create another if statement to check if key code divided by five is equal to one. So now we are moving on to the next category, right, of um, key code. So outside in here, we'll say if key code modulus of five is equal, equal, equal to one. So now this will be another set of keys, right? Uh, another set of keys that have S key code and is divisible. Uh, if, I, if we divide that by five, it has a remainder of one. So there'd be like, you know, numbers like, trying to calculate this in my head, 66, 71, 76, and that kind of, those kind of numbers. So when all of those numbers are triggered, um, are pressed, then we're going to trigger whatever function that we're gonna put in here. So let's actually go ahead and take a look. It says step four e is to call the bouncing ellipse function. Okay, let's go ahead and call that function bouncing ellipse. And inside of the function, we have to pass in an argument that is a random number between minus one and, and minus 150. There are multiple ways of you can do this, right? You can create a temporary um, local, not temporary, it's just a local variable inside of the if statement and say, let random number, and then can say random minus 150. Or you can put this random directly inside of our function as well. So we could have written just random minus 150 in here. And then that would have also worked. Either way works. Let me just comment that out and then put it directly inside, um, put the random function directly inside in here. But then now if you go ahead and press play, and now I'm gonna try pressing the G key because let's go ahead and take a look at in there too. G key has a um, ASCII code of 71. So if we divide 71 by five, it is it has a remainder of one. So now let's go ahead and press that G. And now we've got these bouncing ball things that is creating traces behind it as well. And it bounces around. I feel like this also has a bit of a, you know, window screensaver vibe to it as well, but it's a bit more pastel-y. Um, so then, okay, now we, we're we generating this, the animation continues while that G key is being pressed and it stops uh, when the key is no longer being pressed. We can still put that um, parametric lines animation on top of it, right? If we press another key um, that is, has a remainder of zero when it's divided by five. So if I pressed A key, We've got this parametric lines animation being generated. If I press G again, we've got that um, bouncing ball animation happening again. Woohoo! So we've mapped basically two out of the five categories that we have prepared. Well, I'm going to move in a little bit faster so that we can get all of these visualizations done and <laughs> within time. And so, okay, for the next one, we're going to check if key code divided by five has a remainder of two. And so when that is the case, um, let me move this after here, then we're going to um, call this flower function, which doesn't take in any arguments. So I'm gonna write flower with no argument inside. And if we run that now, and if I press the R key, we've got this like flowery, like loosely flowery um, visualization that's happening around different um, parts of the um, canvas. And we can still have our um, bouncing ball they and our pair of like lollipops. Oh, yeah. Just like they kind of do. Of they kind of like lollipop. a spinning, or like a, if you were to record a yo yo oh, yeah. spinning around <laughs> in like really slow motion, that's, I guess, kind of the pattern it will take, um, draw. But yeah, now we've uh, mapped three different um, visualization functions in here. And moving on to the step five, it says now, we're not. We're done with everything that we want to draw inside the draw function, and now we're saying to add another function called key pressed. Um, so if we go back to our reference, I'm going to close some of these. Uh, if we go back to the reference page, you will see under the keyboard section there is another function called key pressed. So if you go ahead and take a look at that, what that does is that it it is called once every time a key is pressed. So that's a little bit of a difference here. The main difference between using 
Um, detecting key presses using the key is pressed variable inside the draw function. And using it inside the key pressed function is that if you want to have something run while a key is pressed and held down, you will want to do it inside a draw function using the keys pressed function. If you only want to trigger something once and not multiple times, no matter how long the key is pressed down for, then you will want to call that inside of the key pressed B5JS built in function. And we'll make this, um, it, it will be a lot more obvious when we actually add more, the, the rest of the categories inside of this key press function. So I'm going to go ahead and add another function in here and say key press open and close brackets, but I'm going to add the closing brackets outside of it here. And then um, inside of the function, it says, okay, inside the key pressed function, the step for a 5a is to create an if statement to check if a key is not equal to space bar. We did this before in the um, draw function. So the reason why we are leaving out the space bar key is because we want to actually add a special uh, trigger, a special event when the key, uh, the spacebar key is being triggered. So bear with us. And there is a reason why we're leaving that key out. But then, okay, so when the key pressed function is being triggered, as long as the key press is not a spacebar, we're going to go ahead and then we're going to do another key, um, check another key code and, and do a modulus of the key code um, variable. And if it's divisible, it's when you divide it by five, and if the remainder is equal to three, then this time we're going to call a function called rounded rect. So when we get that done, and then we um, you know, run the sketch, and I'm pressing the N key, and you see that only once the the rounded rectangle is drawn only once when we press the um, the end key and no matter how long I'm holding it for it will only draw one rounded rectangle which is very different from you know our parametric lines it only stops drawing the parametric lines or stops animating the lines only when my a key is my my I'm no longer pressing the a key but um, for the rounded rectangle function that is being triggered inside the key pressed function, um, it only draw, what, draws one instance of that shape function, regardless of how long you're holding down the key for. Okay, so then moving on from that, um, I guess we'll then go ahead and um, add the rest of the two. I think we've got one more. Yeah, That's we've right. got one more left. So then we'll check the key code um, value for if the modulus of five, the key code value um, and the remainder is equal to four. Then it will add our loss visualization function, which is the star function. And star function takes in three um, arguments, it says. So that if we will call the star function, but inside of it, we'll need to give a random number between 30 and 50 for the first two arguments, and also give it a random number between four and seven for the last or the third argument. So let's go ahead and do that. And for the first one, I'll give it a random number between 30 and 50. Same for the second number. 30 and 50. And for the third argument, I'm going to give it a random number of between four and seven. So now let's go ahead and play or run the sketch. And I'm going to try pressing the E key. I think it is a little bit less visible. So maybe for this one, I'm going to actually change the um, value of the sketch, the background color a little bit. So it's, oh, oops. I think the E key. So there we go. I think this is a bit more visible, at least yeah. for the stars. So yeah, so this only creates one star. Actually, let me do it with less. It only creates one star um, when, when the E key is pressed. So if I want a lot of star visualizations, I want to keep spamming my E key, then I can get a lot of these. Um, Joshua just joined and asking uh, what language this is. This is JavaScript, um, but it is a JavaScript library called P5JS, and we're using it to create visualizations for the web. Um, if you are more, in, if you're interested in knowing more about it, we are. There's a P5JS course called Learn P5JS that is free, and you can also um, 
take a look at the documentation of the P5.js library if you go to the p5.js.org website as well. It was like a really good, like a <laughs> short brief introduction about what we're doing. Okay, so now that we've got all of these visualizations mapped up, now if I press any key in here, uh, any key into, um, into my um, sketch, actually, I'm gonna bring down the um, color of the background again, because I think this works better when the um, color of the sketch is a little darker. So now if I'm pressing any sort of keys in here and I'm getting all of these visualizations created. So you could kind of like, you know, if you wanted to type a sentence, um, if you wanted to or like type in anything or kind of like, you know, spam your keyboard and you get this sort of like a generated visualization at the end. Um, and then you can, um, yeah. And it's kind of like generating a whole picture, I'd say using uh, predefined functions that are inside of the draw that shapes.js um, file in there for you. But okay, let's say that now, okay, we've created this great tool. I'm kind of like really into this um, generation that I've created in here. How do I save this creation that I've created? There's multiple ways of saving this. You could do a screen capture, right? Uh, you could do, if, if you have Mac, be Command Shift 4, and then you could you know, select that um, area. But there is also a P5.js function that you can use, which is why I'm talking about saving it. There's a function called Save Canvas. Right, I think this is the function that we use. Yeah. Um, basically, that will let you save whatever that is currently being shown to you on the canvas. So in here, using the P5 um, P5.js function called save canvas, what we're gonna do is that we're going to actually detect if the key code is uh, equal to the return or the space, no, not space, return or the enter key. And if that is the case, we're going to use the save canvas function to save whatever we have inside of our sketch. So in here, we're going to say if key code is equal, equal, equal to some sort of an S key code for the return key. So then I'm gonna go back in here and see, oh, this one's a little bit difficult to see. Well, I know that it is um, 13. <laughs> so it says in here that um, carriage return is normally, it's another, like a more formalized way of saying the return key or the enter key. So basically the, um, the ASCII code for that key that you have on your key key co keyboard called return or enter, or I think sometimes has that, you know, the arrow that goes from down and towards the left. Um, that key, the key, ASCII key code for that particular key on your keyboard is 13. So I'm gonna check if the key code of the key that I've pressed is equal to 13. And if that is the case, I'm going to use the save canvas function in here. And then I'm gonna say, um, save canvas. I actually, I've, I always forget what um, argument I need to put in here. But basically I need to say the name of the, Im the image file. And then I have to give it the um, extension of the image that I want it to um, be saved as. Um, you can generally choose from JPG files and PNG files. So in here, I'm going to say, if I, if you want to just keep it really simple, you can say my visual viz, I'll say my viz. <laughs> and then I'll give it a JPG file extension. So if I go ahead, rerun the sketch, let me do a little bit of, you know, typing in here to create different kinds of visualizations. I'm going to hold some keys more than others. Okay. I'm happy with this. I want to save it. If I press the return key, I have, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I've got a file that's called myviz.jpg, and it'll, it'll be saved inside of your downloads for a folder most likely. But um, if I save this again, it's going to create my viz of um, brackets one and two and so on. So if you're okay with that, you can, um, you can go with that. Or if you wanna kind of like automatically generate the, um, like a number that is attached behind the files, then you can do something like, I'm gonna say my canvas, and then I'm gonna put a dash in here. And if we concatenate it with 
the frame count variable. We've seen this, we've used this variable before when we were doing animation, um, but basically this um, number is a P5JS built-in variable that increments during the whole duration of your sketch running. So we know that this is gonna be gonna give us a more or less of a unique file name. So it's going to do my, my canvas zero if you like, you know, save it immediately as soon as your um, uh, P5JS sketch runs or P5, my canvas dash 264 if that's the number of the frame that you are, you've um, pressed the return key to save whatever you have on your canvases. So then let's, let's go ahead. And then if I do press these things. Okay, cool. Then I um, press return. Then I get a file that's called my canvas uh, 55-556.jpg. Oh, I've only saved this um, browser, but if you click on it, it will look the same thing as what you see on the preview window in here. So it's actually a neat thing that you can attach. Like even if you're not creating like a generative art visual visualizer or like a tool that you can use to generate visualizations or anything like that in P5.js, there's like a neat thing that you can put inside of any sketch so that you can you have that ability to save um, whatever that you've created inside your canvas. I think we're gonna maybe leave out. Um, clearing out the um, the canvas in here uh, for now for the sake of time. But if you go to the uh, solution code, which is also linked inside of the YouTube video description, is this it? Oh yeah, it's just not in the same, the file that I want. Um, inside of the key pressed function in here, it doesn't have all the messy step um, instructions in here. So it's a little easier to see. But there is this else, um, else statement that clears the canvas and also um, sets the background color again, because when you use the clear function, it will color your um, P5JS canvas into a transparent color. I guess um, if anyone has any questions, that would be a really good time to talk a little bit about them. But I think, um, oh, there's a question, a follow-up question from Joshua asking, if you can use other languages to get the same effect or do something similar, I think is what he means, uh, what they mean. But basically, um, I'd say that if you're interested in doing something like this and you're not familiar with JavaScript, um, there is also another thing called processing. And Cassie, when she came in, when, when they came in last week, um, talked a little bit about this, but basically P5.js, I don't wanna say is a spinoff, but it was developed uh, with inspiration of things that were done for the processing and processing is a base, it's a Java platform. So if you know how to use Java and if you're more familiar with that kind of languages like, like Java, Python C, this might be something more for you where you can get a little bit started with creative coding, not using JavaScript and using Java. And you, you have to download this application, um, the processing application and will give you like an IDE or development environment where you can do a lot of the things that you can do with p5.js and there's a reference page in here and if you use um, processing a little bit you will quickly notice that it's very similar to p5.js cool do we have any questions morgan do you have questions <laughs> i don't i think that was a very very th uh, thorough walkthrough um <laughs> Again, this is available on the um, Learn P5.js course. So it's inside, today we went through the project that is under the interaction module. Um, so after you go through the lesson on interaction with P5.js on, on mouse and keyboard events, the project for the generative art creator is what we went through on, not on the P Code Academy platform, but on the P5.js web editor. And we'll be continuing to use the web editor for our next, um next live stream and for the next live stream just to have a just talk about it very briefly we're going to talk about uh we're going to walk through this project called interactive video sculpture that we're going to do using images and videos maybe i can actually just give a really really quick sneak peek <laughs> at it it's and this will be one. a yeah you know, this will be the last thing that we do yeah. so yeah we're going to be that, creating um, hmm? oh sorry no go oh, ahead no i was just gonna say that um i know that it says it a little bit in the description here, but the same with the interaction one. There's a lot of um, kind of historical like background to these types of projects that are, if people are interested in, I really recommend looking up the, um, the little description tidbits before the project begins. 
to yeah. kind of get some more re reference for how these, like the basically the history of all this stuff, like computer yeah. graphics or just visuals. So this particular one, the general um, creator that we went through, is very inspired by uh, John Whitney and Vera Molnar. Um, yeah. And so they're very like, you know, the all the shape functions and the draw shape, sorry, the visualization functions, the draw shapes.js file are like, you know, those, the visualization style is very inspired from those two pioneers of computer graphics. And for um, interactive video sculpture that we'll go through next week is very inspired by the Korean American artist Nam Jun Paik. So it's kind of like a digital version of a sculpture that he could have created, I'd say. It's very inspired by him. So yeah, so I think um, that is it for this week's live stream session, but um, we are looking forward to seeing you next week to create the interactive um, video sculpture. Bye.